All right, my friends, are you ready to get rolling? Welcome to the Build Show Live. This is always a fun event. We really get to go nerdy. And of course, I've got some fellow nerds with me on today. Today, we're talking warm board, but specifically radiant heat powered by a heat pump. And believe it or not, you can do it in a cold climate. We got a lot to talk about today, and I've got two really smart people with us here. First off, let me introduce uh, our guests. If you haven't met Terry before, Terry is the inventor, the founder, and the CEO of Warmboard. So you wear a couple of hats, Terry. Uh, and this is not a new company, not a new invention for you. How, how long have you been in business now, Terry? Well, I first invented it back in 1992. Okay. So about 30 years. So three decades now. Yeah, the product was first launched in 1998. So it took a while after I invented it, got a patent and this and that. But we started producing panels in 1998. Gotcha. Well, man, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to talk about this. But you guys have partnered with SpacePack uh, for your source of heat for your radiant floors. And so I've got Jim, the national sales manager and fellow nerd with me today, uh, who's going to spend some time talking about their technology how it works. We're even going to get into some details like what's the coefficient of performance when we get to those really low temperatures. And he's even going to tell us one of the burning questions that I've got, which is how low can we go when it comes to temperature outside? But before we get into all that, Terry, I want to pass the mic to you. Uh, give us a quick overview on what is warm board and why radiant. And then why don't you jump right into uh, uh, this topic today, which is heat pumps. Well, maybe I could start with my motivation for inventing more and board is because I'd done a couple of radiant projects for other clients when I was a practicing architect. And we were using concrete, which caused all kinds of uh, trouble in, in construction. It's 15, uh, well, uh, Portland cement concrete is about 60 pounds per square foot. Uh, gypsum concrete is about 15 pounds per square foot. And the structural load that puts on things is horrendous. Yep. And also, uh, uh, I have a background in physics also. I started engineering physics before I switched to architecture, so I knew a little thermodynamics. It made no sense to me that we were conducting heat with concrete. <laughs> Concrete's a crummy conductor. It's a crummy conductor, it's a crummy insulator. It's kind of a mediocre at both uh, uh, processes. Yep. There's a reason why we make frying pans out of aluminum instead of concrete. Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> I was going to remodel my own house, and uh, I, I had my architect office in my house. So it was going to be my sample bag for my clients. And also I had two kids with asthma, and I knew that radiant heat was good for asthma. So I thought, I'll remodel my house with, uh, with radiant heat. And I looked at all the systems that were out there, and they all seemed more, more stupid than the other. And a lot of them uh, using concrete or, or, or gypsum concrete, uh, or some of them used aluminum in a very inefficient way. And my father was a great engineer. He once told me the best engineer is a lazy man. They're just trying to find an easier way to do something. <laughs> I like that. That's great. Right on. <clears throat> and so uh, we build houses in North America by a system called Western Platform Frame Construction. It's kind of a nerdy thing to say that technical term. Yep. But what that is, is before 1900, we built houses by balloon framing, which is basically walls first, then floors. Yep. Platform framing just changed that order around. Floors first, then walls. And so the, the word platform in platform frame it, uh, refers to the subfloor because a subfloor is this, this central uh, feature in a home that locks the, the home together structurally. It's a thing you can attach cabinets to, flooring to, a bunch of other things to. And it's what made the United States the, the uh, most efficient builder of housing in the world yeah. is uh, Western platform frame construction. So I thought, I wonder if I could come up with some sort of a radiant panel that was the subfloor. And I was doodling on my drafting table one afternoon. I was trying to think if there was some geometry I could use where I could use a single sheet of four by eight sheet plywood, which is what we frame houses with. It's mm -hmm. what is the core of a house. And, uh, and frame a house with it and also have a serpentine pattern of tubes that went back and forth in the surface that would do radiant heat. Literally 15 minutes worth of just doodling on my drafting table. Uh, my dad came over to dinner. He was retired by then. He had, holds 20 patents. And he said, well, it looks like a patentable idea. And I said, I'm sure it's so stupidly simple. Somebody's thought of it before. He says, well, I got some time. I'll do a patent search. And so the net result was that uh, this was all in about November of uh, 1992. So we've been at this for about 30 years. Uh, I filed my patent in 1995. Uh, it was issued in 1998, about the same time as we launched the product. So we've been at this for a while. We've done close to 40 million square feet of radiant heat in North America. Wow. So uh, we're, we're kind of a big deal in the radiant heat business. That's pretty awesome. <clears throat> and you can kind of see from this picture here how it works, is that the idea is that you take this 4 by 8 sheet pan panel, and you can see he's got a skill saw there, he's got, uh, got a nail gun. Um, it, it cuts like a, a, with a skill saw, it nails with a nail gun, it goes right onto joists, as you see, these are trusses actually, but that's a form of a joist system. 
and that's basically warm board. And so let me pause you just for one second. This is a four by eight sheet, just like builders are used to using, you know, instead of a four by eight sheet of OSB or Advantech or whatever, you're gonna use your four by eight sheet uh, in new construction of warm board. And this is your S panel that you guys call it, S for structural. It's our flagship panel that we founded the company on. And it's an inch and eight thick panel, so pretty similar that, than the subfloor that I'm used to using. But instead of the frame carpenter putting down that panel, he's putting this panel down. So it's a, it's basically a one-to-one -one swap. Yeah, basically, so the, the ordinary labor in a reading system goes away because uh, most contractors, once they're familiar with framing with it, find that the labor is almost identical to framing with regular any old subfloor. Yep. So there's, uh, labor is a big component in any radiant system. It's typically over half the cost of a radiant system. And so we t we're trying to figure out ways to wring that labor cost out to make it part of conventional platform frame construction. And so the fact that you can cut it with a skill saw and nail it with a nail gun, you can use panel adhesive just like anything else. And then on top of that, once you've got it down, you can install anything that goes on top of the house, like hardwood or cabinets or anything else just nails directly to it. Um, people ask us, well, how do you avoid hitting the tubes when you're nailing down hard? When I said, I recommend you do your nailing in daylight hours with your eyes open. <laughs> and it's best not to have too many cocktails first. <laughs> and uh, so you can see here, the tubes are quite visible and it's very easy to miss the tubes. Just keep your eyes open and, uh, and, uh, and avoid it pretty easily. And yeah. we've done thousands and thousands, millions of square feet of hardwood, probably half of our, of our uh, construction projects have hardwood on top. It's one of the most popular floor finishes yeah. in, in our projects, as well as any high-end home. And, and the hardwood manufacturers love us. There's a lot of them that recommend warm board. If they're putting down their hardware, they recommend warm board is the best radiant heat solution because you can nail directly to it. Let me pause you for two seconds. Uh, I forgot to mention at the top of the hour, if you've got questions, especially as Terry and Jim are talking, we want to answer those questions. We're going to leave time at the end for 15, 20 minutes of questions. So if you've got a question, don't use the chat, use the Q&A tab on your Zoom, and then I'll be looking at those in a few minutes and can answer those. Um, I did wanna mention though, that's a photo that I personally took. This was at a Stephen Basic uh, architect job in Massachusetts, and it's one of the first times that I'd seen warm board uh, installed, and a real light bulb went off on my head to what Terry said, which is avoiding the tubing, because over the years when I've seen uh, radiant floors over the last 30 years I've been in the business, there was some type of tubing method that was hidden, like underneath. And I, I saw a bunch of different versions of strap the tube up this way or use this aluminum plate and put the tube up. But at the top side, you have no idea where that tube is. And Terry's joke about how do you avoid the tubes? Well, you open your eyes and you have some lights on. That sounds funny, but it's really true. Like when you see this in person, it makes a lot of sense. And this hardwood installer sees the red, uh, you know, open or whoever's PEX tube that is, and it's not hard to avoid. And also as a side note too, I thought it was interesting on this job that he's both gluing and nailing. Uh, and it's a little hard to see here, but he's got some PL premium glue. He's putting a stripe of that down. It's an aluminum uh, facer on top of that warm board. And so that glue, that PL premium works awesome. Uh, and then he's dropping nails in there as well. And when he's popping his nails on that pneumatic nail gun, it's a no brainer to miss the tubes. Hey, let me Sorry, just keep comment on, on that briefly about our aluminum, um, how we adhere it to the wood, because it's very, very important. Because if you want to use that adhesive with it, if it's stuck to the aluminum, but the aluminum's not stuck to the plywood underneath, that's not a very good situation. Great point. And so uh, uh, I once explained to an architect what it takes to bond that aluminum to the plywood. We'd roll the aluminum, and aluminum is very hard to glue to or paint mm -hmm. or do anything else with. That's so you right. have to chromate treat it. So we go through the process of rolling the aluminum, then we coat the top and the bottom with what's called chromate treatment, which prepares mm -hmm. it for being glued and painted to. And then we put an epoxy backer on the back side. We put that uh, polyester, um, catalyzed cat polyester paint on the top side. And as a result, when uh, the APA who regulates our, our manufacturing of our panel, because we have an APA stamp on the bottom. American Plywood Association. Yeah, that, well, it used to be called that, then they changed it to the American Panel Association. Oh, panel. It included, because it included OSB. Yeah. And now they call it APA, the Engineered Wood Society, because they deal with iJoyce and a bunch of other engineered ah. wood. But basically, yeah, you were right. They started off as the American Plywood Association. And when they peel off the aluminum, it shreds the, the, the panel and the, the, the glue is much stronger than the wood itself. That's awesome. And so that's part of what makes this successful. And then we've also had that coating tested by both Tile Council of America and virtually every floor, um, uh, wood floor uh, adhesive company, Bostix, Sika, Bana, all the major ones have tested it for adhesion. 
And so uh, when you glue your wood to that, you know that it's stuck down and it's not gonna cup or warp or get gaps in or anything else. And that's part of what makes this so favorable to hardwood suppliers. And then on top of it, you were talking about not hitting the tubes. Mm -hmm. You can see the bottom of this panel here. Uh, we had early on, we had a, a cable TV installer go underneath a house and drill on up to install a cable, and guess what he hit? Of course, a tube. <laughs> and then we started printing the pattern of the tube on the bottom as well. Oh, so I so didn't now when, when, that. A, when, when a plumber or an electrician's underneath a house in a crawl space they or a basement, he bottom. can see exactly where all the tubes are. And then this is an example of um, uh, wide plank hardwood nailed directly to the warm board. You also saw in that previous picture. So that's an interesting thing to see about the, the, uh, the panel. That's awesome. Moving on. And uh, this is a cross section through the panel. It's seven layer dug for plywood. Uh, most um, contractors, when they look at their plywood, this is amazed at the quality of the plywood. It's, uh, it's very stiff and strong. And even though we have cut uh, five eighths inch wide grooves in the panel, because those typically go at right angles to joists, this feels like inch and a subfloor to walk on. It's an incredibly sturdy subfloor. And also in terms of hardwood, the Hardwood Flooring Association will tell you that it's not acceptable to nail off hardwood to three quarter inch subfloor. And if you've ever been underneath a house where they nailed hardwood to it, you see nail tips sticking out down below. Mm -hmm. Well, if the nail, sticks, uh, nail tip is sticking in air, it has no pull out power. Mm -hmm. And so the recommended uh, depth for uh, hardwood installation is either two layers of five eighths or one layer of inch and eighth. And guess what, we're inch and an eighth. And that's one huh. of the reasons why we work so well with hardwood. I didn't realize that. And then you can see that the aluminum is continuous and goes down into the groove. Nobody else does this. It requires a 600 ton press and half a million dollar dies to stamp that aluminum to do that. It turns out it ain't easy to stamp this aluminum. It's not easy to make warm board in general. And so actually our patents have run out, but nobody's attempted to do what we do because we have trade circuits about how we stamp it, how we adhere it, all these kinds of things kind of protect our technology. Good for you. And we are the only company that does a continuous sheet of aluminum over an entire floor, including the curved sections, including the straight sections, everywhere there's aluminum. That means every square inch of your floor is heated evenly. That's neat. The other thing I'd point out on that photo, I think I actually took that photo from one of your samples, is that that aluminum is much thicker than I expected. You know, when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, was it aluminum foil on there? You know, mm -hmm. some Reynolds wrap on there? No, it's like, it seems l almost as thick as the uh, PEX uh, tubing that you're seeing there. Uh, it just feels like a really thick thickness of aluminum, which means that it's going to move that heat really There's well. There's no question about it because the job of radiant panel is really <clears throat> simple. We conduct heat from water in a tube to the surface of your floor, period, end of sentence. That's all we do. Mm -hmm. And so conductivity is king, as we like to say. And yep. one of the nice uh, uh, factors of that is as conductivity goes up, water temperature can go down, which we're going to talk about shortly with Jim about how important it is to the equipment that he used, that he makes for us, that uh, the low temperature water makes his equipment work so much better. And a big part of it is the thickness of the aluminum, the fact that it's continuous, and also the alloy that we use. We use 1070 alloy, which is 99.7% pure aluminum. Mm. And it has the highest conductivity. It has as much as 30% more conductivity than other uh, aluminum alloys. And you mentioned other people use uh, uh, aluminum in their systems. I know one company that uses four thousandths of an inch of aluminum. I know mm. another one uses 10 thousandths. Another one uses 15 thousandths. We use 25 thousandths. And, and that thick aluminum is what makes it work. Just like when you go out and buy a frying pan, you know, if you go down to William Sonoma or some other gourmet shop, you're gonna buy a frying pan with a thick aluminum bottom because thick aluminum means more even heat, faster conduction of heat. Yep. And also, as I said, as conductivity goes up, water temperature can go down. Smart. And we also make a remodel product. After we made the uh, warm board for a number of years, we found increasingly people were buying warm board S and overlaying it on top of uh, existing construction because they wanted the conductivity and the compatibility with hardwood flooring and et cetera, et cetera. So we started making a version of warm board that's virtually thermodynamically identical. It's the same thickness of aluminum, the same stamped uh, uh, panel. It, it's stamped in the same dies. It's basically made in the same way, except it's a slightly thinner panel. It's 13 16 inch thick. And it's uh, a two foot by four foot, which uh, is easier to carry through door frames and up staircases and remodel situations. And here you can see somebody nailing it down. And then people often ask, well, how do you deal with the aluminum? And doesn't that dull your, sc your skill sauce? I said, no, carbide is about twice as hard on the rope mo ro uh, hardness uh, scale as aluminum. It cuts aluminum like butter. Mm. It definitely doesn't, uh, the, the glue on the panel is going to uh, dull your blades more than the aluminum will. Yeah. And uh, people wonder, well, how do you drive uh, nails or screws through it? I said, with a screw gun or a, it's or a no hammer. Deal. It's yeah. very soft Send aluminum. It. As you can yeah. see here, you just take a standard decking screw, it goes just through it like, you know what, through a goose. 
And that's your R panel, which is your thinner board, because you can see it's going on top of an existing sub subfloor. But correct? the fastening is still the same RRS. In many respects, the two products perform identically. They they install almost identically. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference is one is smaller and thinner for remodels, and the other one's thicker and bigger for uh, uh, new construction. Makes sense. And as you saw before, you can nail hardwood to it. I mean, here's a good example of uh, herringbone. People wouldn't think you could put this kind of hardwood on top of a, of a, of a radiant panel, and yet you can. And one yep. of the other reasons why we're so kind to hardwood is because we're so conductive, the, the, the delta T across the surface of the panel is very, very low. Typically, mm -hmm. it's about two degrees in a hardwood insulation. It's about two degrees of variation between top dead center of tube and halfway in between. Wow. Which means that if you uh, evenly heat the wood, it's going to expand and contract very evenly. and will not get the cupping and warping and the crackling and things like that that you get with other panels. So the, the thick aluminum has so many benefits. And it's interesting, when I got my patent, that's one of the arguments you have with uh, the patent offices. You know, everything is a horseshoes and hand grenades kind of a, a thing. How <laughs> There's always somebody close to you, right? <laughs> right? And how do you differentiate? And they say, if there are unanticipated benefits due to your invention, that is an argument for your invention that it's unique. That and one sense. of the un unintended consequences, I didn't intend it to be great for hardwood, but it turns out it is. Yeah. And uh, uh, ma I, basically, I was just trying to save labor was what I was trying to do. But yeah, it, it had many, sense. many other uh, benefits. And, and also how well it works with, uh, with the, 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 the equipment that's going to heat the hot water. Again, because whether it's a boiler or a heat pump or whatever you're talking about, it's always better to heat lower temperature water than higher temperature water. Yep. And then um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of radiant. Um, it was invented 2,000 years ago. It's really the oldest form of, of central heat. The Romans, mm -hmm. about 2,000 years ago, uh, they... Uh, uh, invented these systems called hypocost systems. Hypo is a Greek word which means under, and cost means is a Latin word which means to burn. So they would burn fires, uh, fires underneath stone slab uh, floors in a cavity that was underneath them. That would heat the stone, and that would heat your house. At about the same time in the Far East, the Koreans were doing the same thing. They called them ondol systems, which is a Korean word which means um, a hot stone. Hmm. I was just in Korea about a week ago, and I saw my first actual live ancient ondol house. It was just it was wonderful because I'd seen these pictures in, in history books. And I saw a real, from about the 1700s, a house with an Ondal system. It was really uh, So they'd cool make a fire below the floor. Exactly. And the smoke and the heat would radiate. They, they'd have flues and out in the have a flue uh, yeah, coming up and yeah, around. Exactly, exactly. That's neat. And, <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why we use high mass systems is because uh, low conductivity high mass systems is that if you had, let's say, an iron floor, in a Roman house or a, or a Korean house, you'd burn your feet, it'd be like walking on a pancake griddle. So they wanted low conductivity, and they wanted the, the flywheel effect, the slow heat up and slow cool down of, uh, of uh, massive systems because those fires didn't burn consistently at the same temperature all the time. Well, we kind of kept that technology and followed it forward. In the 1800s, the, the Brits, they had a number of Roman uh, ruins in, in Britain that had these hypocaust systems in it, they thought, Hmm, I wonder how we could do something like that. And they started uh, pouring concrete slabs and putting iron pipe down on the slabs. And that was the era of modern radiant, was pipes mm. in slabs with hot water in it. And, uh, and typically heated with a boiler, often fired by coal, sometimes by wood, that sort of thing. But as we come forward into the modern era, then we, we started uh, trying to find increasing ways to be more efficient, to, to uh, use less carbon, and you know, one of the things that's allowed the United States to lower its carbon footprint significantly is natural gas. Mm -hmm. And so that was the next progression. And so this is up until recently, this is our, our main source of uh, heating warm board. We decided to come up with, after we invented the panel, we wanted to come up with all the infrastructure that would heat the water for the panel. So we started doing what we call the warm board comfort system. And that was an everything soup to nuts, plug and play, pre-engineered, pre-designed system for you. And this was our first offering, and this is a, uh, a gas boiler. And, and that lock and bar system still is your main, uh, you know, still what you're selling probably the most of today, right? Exactly, and if you, if you see modern, uh, if you've seen radiant systems in the recent years, you, you look like they almost belong on a nuclear submarine. Yeah. There are pipes and pumps and gauges and boxes of electrical stuff in it going everywhere. And, and if, you, if you give a radiant system to 10 different radiant installers, you'll get 10 different systems, yeah. which means that at least nine out of 10 probably got it wrong, if not 10 out of 10. Right. And so when we came up with this system, what we were trying to do, again, going back to my father saying that the best engineer is a lazy man, we tried to make it easy for plumbers to do this. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have the, the, we didn't want radiant specialists to be doing radiant heat. We wanted average journeyman plumbers. Just anybody with a plumbing license could do it. 
And so we started putting all that complexity into this single box here. There's a little exterior plumbing on it, but there's not much. Compared to anything else you've ever seen, this is a very, very compact system. And uh, I would point out too that Lock and Var, which is uh, your natural gas partner or propane partner in this case, also made in Tennessee, which is kind of cool. We get our aluminum from Tennessee. We get our um, uh, plywood from Oregon. Mm -hmm. We get our boilers from Tennessee. Uh, we're not jingoist that much, but a little bit. I, yeah. I'm kind of like, a, if you can, buy American. Yeah, and so, well, it makes sense. Yeah, exactly, why that. not? And I'll tell you another big advantage of it. We used to get a boiler that came from Korea. And uh, when it sat off of Long Beach for about six weeks ready to get unloaded, that's when we started to go to, uh, to a Tennessee supplier. We yeah, decided, let's, let's just get out of the Far East in general to the extent we can. Yep. And so probably about 87% of our, of our uh, components in our system come from the U.S. That's cool. But then uh, we, the, the latest move is to go all electric. And our first option for electric was an electric boiler. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys are familiar with what a COP is. It stands for Coefficient of Performance. And what it basically says is if you take a kilowatt of electricity, uh, how much heat do you get out of it? If you get a kilowatt of heat out of uh, a kilowatt of electricity, that is by definition a coefficient of performance of one, a COP of one. Right, 100% efficient, as we would say, right? Yeah, that's a way of restating the first law of thermodynamic. It just says that, that energy is conserved. So if you lose energy from your wiring, it comes into heat in your home on a one-to-one -one basis. So I guess it's a way of saying 100% efficient, but electricity is expensive. Yeah. So you're 100% uh, at burning a, a very expensive fuel. Yeah. And so that brings in, us into the heat pump uh, uh, business is heat pumps are a way of actually beating that number. And it, they didn't reinvent the laws of physics. We have not invented perpetual motion machines here, but it is possible with a heat pump to get as high as five kilowatts of heat out of one kilowatt of electricity in, in the most extreme version. Most heat pumps, I think, op Jim, if I'm correct, they're operating about the two to four range. Uh, two to four range yeah, under normal, normal operating yeah, conditions. exactly. Correct. And Terry, while you're talking too, I wanna to point out, uh, if you haven't, I'm not sure if we've had this on camera yet, but we do have the space pack unit in the studio here. It's just a little off camera for our main camera. But this is one of the units. I think this is the 60,000 BTU space pack unit that Jim will tell us more about. But I just wanted to point out that that is in studio and what you're seeing there is an example of what's uh, being used in the warm board system. So this is our first launch of the uh, space pack. This is the indoor unit. He will talk to you about the outdoor unit, but there's an outdoor unit that uh, uh, sucks heat out of the air. And by the way, the reason why it's able to get these COPs is because it's not making the heat. It's getting the heat that already exists in the air. And even though the air may be cold, you can make it colder. Mm -hmm. And if you make the air colder, then you can use that heat that you sucked out of the air. You can pump it inside the house and heat your house. And anybody who uh, is confused about what a heat pump is, I think all of you guys own a heat pump. If you own a refrigerator, a refrigerator is a heat pump. That's right. And so your beer inside gets cold and that black thing on the back side of the refrigerator gets warm. And that's just simply a, a heat pump pumping heat from the inside of the box to the outside of the box. And that's the same principle that all heat pumps operate on, except that it's one thing to have a refrigerator that has a single plug, you plug it in, it keeps your beer cold. It's another thing to heat uh, five or 10 rooms in a house and mm -hmm. uh, do it with an outdoor unit, et cetera, et cetera. That's where yeah. the complexity gets into yeah. the modern heat pump system. But you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but one of the reasons why a Space Pack likes working with us so much is we've always taken the attitude that we we're gonna engineer the whole system. Even going back to our original panel, because we knew it was a structural component in the house, we knew we had to do a drawing for every single house. Yep. So since the inception of Warm Board, we have in inputted the, the drawings from an architect, either pencil drawings or CAD drawings, and we have a huge design department. It worked about 18 mechanical engineers now that work for us. Wow. I think we have one of the larger uh, mechanical engineering firms in the country. And by the way, we're licensed in 37 states and 13 provinces. So we went through the process of getting wet stamps so that uh, we are uh, we sail through building uh, departments. They approve our plans very rapidly to see the wet stamp on there. It just makes it that more efficient for the, the contractor and for the, the homeowner and saves them money. Everything about this is intended to wring labor and complication out of the system. So let me ask you a question real quick while you're on the slide. So that outdoor unit from Space Pack is making heat and that heat is coming to this, what, talk to me about the white tank that I'm seeing there. What is, what's going on with that tank? Well, I'll let Jim talk to that. All right, Jim, let's speak on it. So, so what we're looking at now is, is a buffer tank. In theory, a buffer tank is going to do a couple of different things. It's gonna be a great way for us to store energy that we've created, our heated water, right? Um, as well as kind of decouple the flows. So depending on what we have for a system, we may need a little bit of flow uh, going to a small radiant zone, perhaps. We may need a lot of flow, maybe going to a much larger zone. 
So what that does is gives us an opportunity to kind of uh, store the energy and also allow the, the systems, and our systems uh, now are fully inverter driven with both fans and compressors, allows them to run at their most efficient state. So even as efficient as these systems run, they're more efficient a, when they're off, or B, when they're running. So we want the systems to come on, turn on, run, reach their most efficient state, and stay there until that load has been satisfied. So on small load applications, we're basically looking at a buffer tank as a battery, right? And our heat pump outside is that charger that's keeping that battery ready to go anytime the system requires it. And that's modulation good, is so important. Uh, we have always been uh, in, involved in doing modulating systems rather than constant temperature systems because the outside temperature is constantly changing. You know, if you have a Thanksgiving dinner, 10 people walk into your house, they carry 500 BTUs with each person. So 5,000 BTUs just walked into your house. And then you put a turkey in the oven, there's another 10,000 BTUs that's been pumped into your house. And the system has to be able to respond to that. Mm -hmm. Then you decide to go to bed and you turn down your thermostat to 65 because it's always more pleasant to sleep in the cold bedroom. Well, that's going to be less uh, uh, tax on it. So the buffer tank is kind of a, uh, a bridge between the modulation and the output. And one way of thinking about uh, modulation is that uh, your car may have 200 horsepower, but when you're driving level on a freeway, you only need maybe 40 horsepower mm -hmm. to just overcome the wind friction, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're entering a freeway or climbing a hill, you may need all of that. And so pushing down that, uh, uh, that gas pedal is a modulation. And that's basically what, uh, what our systems do. We modulate for the, the, the current needs, and the current needs are always changing. And people talk about steady state, nothing's steady state in the world. Things are always modulating. Yeah. And if I could interject real quick, uh, don't forget, Jim, to tell us uh, about inverters uh, for your heat pump, for your compressor, because if I understand it correctly from, from the semi-nerd uh, over here who likes HVAC but isn't an engineer, uh, inverter technology, which is what you guys use, which is what I use on my heat pumps that I use to heat and cool my houses with forced air systems, does the same thing. It's that gas pedal mm -hmm. on the compressor. So it's not just like old school compressors that we had on our air conditioning systems that were a four ton, that they, they, were, they were either off or they were putting 48,000 BTUs of cooling load on the house. This is able to modulate. You, you up had and two down. conditions: too hot or too cold. <laughs> right, that's and, right. And, and if you wanted to think about the essence of comfort, and we always talk about comfort, we call this the comfort system. And I'll tell you what the comfort system is. The most remarkable thing about the comfort system is nothing. You don't hear it. You don't see it. You're always the right temperature, no matter what happens to inside occupancy, to outside temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. And after a while, you forget you have a heating system. Yep. And that is our goal, is to have you forget that you have a heating system. Never touch the thermostat because it's always keeping at the right temperature. To never go, home, go ahead and fuss with things or even be con concerned yourself with things. And you could say that comfort is the absence of discomfort. We know when we have our cruel shoes on that we hate them, we can't wait to get them off at the end of the day. But when we have our Uggs or our top siders or some other comfy shoe on, we forget we have shoes. Yeah. We actually had a very interesting uh, anecdote from one of our uh, region managers. Uh, she has a little toddler that was going off to preschool. And on the first day of preschool, the teachers explained to him that it's now slipper time. And she asked the teacher, what are slippers? because she lived in a radiant home. <laughs> <laughs> never, never had any. Yeah, never needed them. Exactly, I, I tell that story all the time, I love it. It's, oh, it's yeah. kind of right. cute. Yeah. Meaning her floors were perfectly yeah. comfortable and that's, she never had it. to put the slippers on to keep her And what you warm. see on that wall is possible because we do all these drawings. I brought a hog roll of drawings here just to give you an idea about what we do for you. And it's all included in the price, by the way. It's just bundled into the price. This is about 20 pages of drawings here that go through every possible detail in your house. The complete heat loss analysis, room by room, all your plumbing layouts are in there, all your electrical layouts are in there. That's awesome. And, and this is necessary for a uh, contractor to be not only efficient, but to be correct. Yeah. Because one of the things we want out of these things is we want them be, to be reliable. We call it plug and play. Um, I saw this ad once for Apple, and it was by uh, uh, Jeff Goldblum, and he was talking about how to use a Mac. He says, step one, open the box. Step two, plug it in. <laughs> there is no step three. And we're not quite there yet, but we're trying to move that direction. Sure. That's awesome. I love it. And then this is the electrical layout here. Uh, we do all of our own controls. We've engineered all of them. We have a tremendous, uh, not only do we have our own mechanical engineers, we have our own product development engineers who are very gifted people from Silicon Valley. We happen to you know, be right next to Silicon Valley, so it's a rich source of talent for people to do this. And people kind of like getting into this bricks and mortar, nuts and bolts thing, as opposed to the, 
the, the fuzzy stuff that happens over in Silicon Valley. Yeah, this gets so thrown easy. away every two or three sure, years, absolutely. and your warm board system is going to be running for a few decades. Well, the oldest house in, in my town, I grew up in New Jersey, and the oldest town was built in 1620, and it's still there. That's awesome. And so as an architect, I always figured that uh, uh, houses need to last at least 100 years. So we engineer everything at warm board to have at least a 100-year lifetime. That's awesome. And I'm going to hand this over to Jeff, uh, uh, Jim now. Uh-oh. We lost our uh, feed. Will you, uh, will you help us out with that, Mercedes? So, Jim, uh, a couple things I'd love for you to address. First off, tell us who Space Pack is for people who don't know. Yep. And then I want you to, to feel free to be a little nerdy on, you know, what kind of performance is this, uh, can we expect out of this heat pump? And I want you really to spend a few minutes addressing uh, that cold climate, right? Because okay. you're, you're probably not putting radiant floors in if you live in Florida or Hawaii. I expect you don't sell a lot of systems there. Um, well, actually, I lived in Florida for a while. You know what they freak out about in Florida? Frost. Yeah. If you're a citrus <laughs> grower and it happens down there. And I, yeah. I was in Miami once when it got and it froze in Miami. So they don't need it very much. But, <laughs> but every place in North America needs a little bit of heat. But before you finish, Jim, I want yeah. you to answer that question, which I teed up at the beginning, which is, how cold and how efficient? Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that for sure. A little bit of background on SpacePack uh, for all of those listening or watching that don't know. Uh, SpacePack has really been around for quite some time, owned by a larger company called Meztech. They're based out of Westfield, Massachusetts. Um, SpacePack as a company originated on small duct high velocity, right? You may or may not be familiar with it. It's an air distribution system. And about a dozen years or so ago, uh, we started getting into the thought of, hey, we uh, maybe a little bit of ahead of our time at that 12 years, but I'm, I'm thankful for that as to where I sit today. Uh, we need to start looking into a little different way of, of heating water, and maybe we can cool it too if we need to. Meztech being a high efficiency commercial gas and uh, uh, electrified boiler company, um, we're kind of already in that market of really understanding hydronics, okay? Both pumping, piping, BTUs, moving capacities, flow, and things of that nature. So it kind of came, uh, kind of came second nature to us a little bit. Uh, about 12 years ago, we brought the first um, these air to water heat pumps here. And uh, a little background on myself, although I've been in the industry for about 22 years since the, pretty much three days after high school. My goodness, but uh, I put some of the very first Space Pack air to water heat pumps in hmm. 12 years ago as an independent contractor. So I kind of have that. Uh, the good and bad luck, if you will, of really seeing this very uh, fledgling type product or, or thought process or heating and cooling process from really its infancy in North America here. Um, it's come a long way, right, from single stage to compressors to variable speed compressors and fans that we're going to get into modulation. And then one of the things that we're really, we're really proud of with the warm board is it's, it's kind of taken what everybody wants in a heating system as far as the comfort and the efficiency, but let's just put it this way, we're all maybe a little bit too busy to put in all of that nuts and bolts and paperwork. Warm board wraps that up in a really nice package for all of us, right? So it's really bringing this high-end heating system with all the bells and whistles to the everyday good quality contracting installer, right? Mm -hmm. Just really where we wanna be. So. In our, uh, in our growth process, right, we've had heat pumps that are designed for normal, mild climates, and we've had heat pumps that are designed more for the cold climates. Like right here next to me is our newest release, and one that'll be showcased many times uh, through warm board installations uh, is the, uh, it's called the ILEHP, right, or the Solstice Inverter Extreme. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more on the graphs, but We'll Let's put call it the cold climate unit. Cold climate heat pump, right? <laughs> We're going to get into uh, into cold climate applications because at the at the end of the day, if we need heat, we're putting heat in our house. It's because we need heat, regardless of where we're at, right? And we can put BTU capacities out on these units into well below zero and even into the, the 15 and 20 degrees below zero range. We'll start talking about- Fahrenheit, by the way. Fahrenheit, correct, not Celsius here, so. Uh, but we can obviously help we you get with some those. Canadians and maybe even some Europeans watching. So we need to make sure we, we clarify that. And we do a fair amount of installations in that Canadian market, right? One of our yep. largest and fastest growing market is in that Pacific. We Northwest do a lot of ca Canada too. And, so, and, yeah. and north of there. And so. let me pause you for one second. I don't know that I teed this up super well at the beginning, but a big reason why I think Terry sought out Space Pack 
uh, or sought out this uh, heat pump technology is because builders like me in a lot of parts of the country uh, are being forced to say, hey, we can't use natural gas anymore. Mm -hmm. Or if we can't today, I'm seeing in the not too distant future that I won't be able to use natural gas or propane. And you mentioned Canada and Vancouver in particular. I visited uh, Vancouver, BC about three years ago, saw some fantastic builders. I was super impressed with what was happening there in the building community. But those builders knew in 2030 in Vancouver, there is no longer an option for mm -hmm. them as a new construction builder to install any gas burning appliances. So if they don't have this on the horizon, they don't know. They don't know what they're going to do. Uh, and with that background, keep going. I didn't mean to interrupt. And you, if I, I could interrupt real briefly, and for Warmer, it was a great challenge because we had built our, our company around gas boilers, and we mm -hmm. knew that they were going away. In a lot mm -hmm. of California in 2023, you can't get a gas hookup. Oh, is that right? It's 2023 already. Right? Yeah, yeah I and I think that. they may have rolled it back a little bit. Not in New York, they did the same. But although I think they rolled it back a little bit there they too. But we back. know that these are some of our biggest markets. And we knew we needed a heat pump op uh, option. And no offense, uh, uh, Jim, but we looked at a lot of other options. And there's a lot of other heat pumps. And it was clear that, that uh, Space Pack had the best technology. And, uh, and not only did they have the best technology, and that's when we first found you for your, your uh, conventional ambient, mm -hmm. but, but uh, when you started coming out with the cold climate version, I thought, oh, this is great for us. Because especially you go up to Canada and the, the BC includes not only Vancouver, but you go further north and it gets really cold up yeah, there. Yeah, Vancouver so we, is actually pretty mild. Frankly. Yeah, right. yeah but, but uh, that same guy calls on Saskatchewan and mm -hmm. it's uh, Manitoba, cold up there. Yeah, and it's that, really cold there. And the temperature starts to dip. Yeah. So, so over the years, uh, and most recently, we've been able to kind of grow our lineup of air-to-water heat pumps to really encompass anything in that Canadian North American market, right? Whether we're talking about really warm climates and we have primary cooling application or in our colder climates where we're really dealing with specifically heating applications, right? Um, the unit that we, uh, to, to kind of, let's say, break this out for, for folks that aren't truly familiar with how this is going to apply to their particular home, although we partner really well with uh, Warmboard and they do a lot of what you're seeing on this drawing here, just this cutaway, is done for you behind the scenes. But in essence, to get an idea of the conceptual operation here, we've got our unit that sits outside. There's our solstice air to water heat pump, okay? Air to water because we're taking energy, as Terry mentioned earlier, out of the air, okay? And transferring it through a coil, through a refrigerant circuit, okay, into the refrigerant, and then through a plate exchanger or a tube and shell exchanger, depending on the unit, uh, into the water, right? And from that water, we're pumping it actually inside. Inside goes to the buffer tank. The buffer tank, which we spoke of before, can be multiple different sizes and it's, you, it's sized specifically for the need. A uh, larger load, uh, generally the larger the, the heat pump, or I'm sorry, the larger the buffer tank required. But you can see here from that buffer tank, we're not really reinventing the wheel here, right? We're just, you, we have a, a new really efficient way to heat that water, okay? I, I kind of throw out hypothetically, we've got a really efficient electric boiler that sets outside. So from there, from a manifold system or from the warm board comfort system box, we go to the rest of the home, whether it be radiant. Like I said, if we have a hybrid system where we may need heating and cooling, there's fan coil options, whether it be uh, small duct high velocity air distribution or regular fan coils themselves, low temperature baseboard. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, water temperatures, but in the range, you can expect air, our air to water heat pumps to deliver anywhere in the low 40 degree Fahrenheit to upwards of 130 plus degree Fahrenheit water at any wow. given time. Now, water and temperature values don't change, BTU levels will change, the amount of, you know, uh, that we can deliver. So, I'm sorry, let me pause you for one sec because I'm curious and I bet people are thinking this. Your, your space pack unit is sending it to the buffer tank and it could be anywhere from 40 to 140, basically. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big delta T. What does your system need, Terry? What does the warm board flooring want to be? One of our bragging rights is in the in the industry, we use the lowest temperature water of any radiant system that exists on the planet, mostly because of that thick aluminum, the fact that it's on top of the panel, it's directly underneath your finished floor goods, and the tubing is very well thermodynamically connected to it. But as a result, <clears throat> Most of our systems operate in about the 85 to 110 degree range. Oh, wow. Which so is not quite that low. Hot. Yeah. Now, there are some rating systems that operate as high as 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, you start getting into staple up and things like that, they require a very hot temperature. 
Uh, you know, there are some slab systems that need upwards to 140. They can't go above 150 before you degrade the, the slab, but you can go up to 140 to almost 150. But we're at, you know, a good 30, 40 degrees below that. And so I remember seeing an ad once for BASF and it says, we don't make X, but we make X better because of their components they put in it. And so Warmbord doesn't make uh, heat pumps, but we make heat pumps work better because we give them the opportunity to make the lowest temperature water, which gives them the highest COPs. Yeah. And, and we mentioned before, even off camera, we said if, if, if someone's out there and the, what they want to do is they want to spend less money or less cost or be more efficient, the lower the water temperature you can use to heat your house to to end up with the same result, the more efficient your system's going to be. Our heat pumps have a great range of uh, outlet temperature offering, but at that same, uh, on that same note, if we're only having to deliver 100 or 110 degree water, and we'll see in a, in a chart here coming up, we can do that much, much more efficiently than if we're trying to do 120 or 130 or 130 plus degree water. So the space back system, the air to water heat pump is a very adaptable system, not only to uh, new construction, but significant amount of installs throughout the country are retrofit as well. As you can say, we've been doing air to water heat pumps for, for a dozen years here in North America. And I put our split, um, it's starting to grow actually a little bit now, but probably about 65% uh, new construction and 35% uh, in, uh, in the retrofit. Mm. And generally though, if we're dealing with a, a situation where we already have a current low temperature application, a current radiant, current low temp baseboard. It's kind of already a potential candidate for an air to water heat pump. Hmm. Pretty cool. So to get a little bit into the, uh, into the graphic of how are these things actually working, right? We kind of see a cutaway of this outside unit, this magic box, if you will. One of the reasons, um, you know, one of the, the many reasons I should say, right, Terry, that warm board likes working with us is not only our equipment is great, but it's also simple because the simple you make something, the more efficient it's going to be, the easier it is going to be to work for, the easier it is going to be to service if needs service or install. So our units come prepackaged. Uh, we have to control them by turning them on and off through the comfort system control and, uh, and pipe them, all right? And the piping and the pumping and all of warm board applications are done in-house by them. So understanding the flow rates and the pressure drops and things of these units aren't necessarily top of mind as they would be if you were doing it um, you know, on your own. But if we look at the system, we have a, high, uh, a refrigerant-based system setting outside. We have a compressor, we have a reversing valve, uh, condenser, evaporator, fan coils, just like you would see. So in this cutaway, we're in heating mode. That compressor is running, and depending on the location of that reversing valve, we are either going to send hot refrigerant gas to the exchanger, okay, or cold refrigerant gas. Now in this, uh, this photo, we're sending the hot refrigerant gas. The cold re refrigerant gas is going up through the evaporator coil, which as Terry said, we're, the, cold, the air is cold, but we're making it colder. Mm. Okay, we're, that evaporator coil temperature could very well be uh, in the, the teens and single digits. Okay, so as long as that air temperature is above what our coil temperature is, evaporator temperature is outside, we're extracting heat from that, yep. which gives us the ability. Now, our, um, our cold climate heat pumps have what we call a, a vapor injection or EVI compressor. And basically what that does is on the compression stroke, it splits the, uh, the refrigerant value, if you will, kind of like a, a turbo in a car and taking a little bit of that and building it back up so that the compressor spins a little bit faster, a little bit more efficiently, takes a little huh. bit of the load away, and actually increases its capacity for us to be able to get those uh, much lower uh, ambient temperatures with a higher, more efficient output. And I can't tell you how important that is because for a lot of people, they think the heat pump, you're gonna get the COPs of three or four, mm -hmm. but you start getting down to the really cold climate, your COP is quickly going to one because yeah. The, the heat pump can no longer produce heat out of that air and it needs to use some sort of a resistive form of heat as a boost. It's called a boost heater. And, and that has been, typically been a big component of uh, systems that operated below, I think about five degrees even. Yep. And But now they have this uh, a cold climate unit, which can operate down to how low is it? Negative uh, 22, we have uh, rated which, which means very few parts of the world can you not get some heat out of the air yep. with that unit. So even though it's minus 20 out, mm -hmm. we're still able to extract BTUs out of that outdoor air and send it through our heat pump 
uh, and heat our floors with it. That's, That's pretty and, wild. And more importantly, yeah. it's, it, you don't need to turn on your boost heater because your boost heater has a COP of one, and maybe the, the heat pump goes down to 1.5 or two mm -hmm. when it's in that mode, but it's still about one and a half to twice as, as efficient as mm -hmm. if you use resistive. That's the crazy. Only, the only time that, that boost heat really comes into play is if the overall system output doesn't quite cover what the load is currently at that home, right? All right, so let me break this down a little bit for the builders out there that are in Minnesota, in Maine, and these, you know, or Moose in, jaw. Or in <laughs> uh, yeah, in Canada. This means that that heat pump, even though it's zero outside, has full heating capacity. Am I saying that right? It's, or it's close kept to diminished. Full? We'll, we'll talk about that. It okay. does drop because as the colder it gets, just like the in air, other words, air pump that we're familiar with, you're not needing resistance heat necessarily, even though it might be zero degrees But there's the outside. flip side of this. If you're in a mild cold climate, let's say maybe 30 or 40, you can get COPs as high as four or five. Yeah, yeah he's about to talk yeah, about that thing, on that Things slide, starting right? to come up. And we're, when we look through flow through our units, and, and we also have, we talked a little bit about boost heat and that buffer tank up earlier. Our buffer tanks have uh, you know, standard issue elements in them, right? Boost heat elements. These, these units do go into what we call a defrost, Right, if it's if they're operating in a temperature where there's moist air and those coils again could be single digits or below, <laughs> right? It's You're still going to get gonna, some It's going to build some ice up, yeah. right? And then they're going to go into defrost. Boost heat comes in in a defrost feature, right? Because if that unit goes into defrost, essentially for a short period of time, it's not producing any heat. Okay, it's worrying about uh, kind of regenerating itself, defrosting, getting ready for the for the heat cycle. That boost heat can come on and kind of help us through there for that very short amount of time. When our water comes in, we, we generally target somewhere around a, a seven to 10 degree delta T, mm -hmm. but we're running these units at 12 to 14 GPM, depending on the application, mm -hmm. right? So we're flowing a lot of water through these units outside and still maintaining a pretty significant delta. That's awesome. Um, showing here, we've got a little, little chart, uh, ILHP. So that is this current unit here that I have sitting next to me to the left. We look at um, our uh, actually, this is COP first, so. Uh, Jim, we'll it's a little hard to see, potentially, for the folks watching this at home, depending on what size screen they're Fair on. Fair enough. Will you, will you give them the verbal version of yep. this slide? So the verbal version is uh, at 100 degree water, just like with anything else, if we are, the, the warmer it is, okay, outside, the warmer the ambient temperature, the more capacity this system can potentially make here, right? So the way we're looking at this right now, did that change on me here? We've got two of the same slide. Okay. So uh, let me just pause you for one second. On the very bottom of the screen, the scale is ambient temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So we're down to minus 22 down here on, on mm -hmm. the far left, up to 100 degrees in the far right. And as you angle upwards, the scale on the left is the coefficient of performance. In other right. words, when I put uh, 1,000 watts in, or 1,000, I guess I should say one kilowatt, one kilowatt in, in, how much heat am I gonna get? And at the very lowest of the scale, if I, uh, hopefully I'm not stealing your thunder no, here. No, take it away. Uh, even if it's minus 20 out, I'm getting still a coefficient of performance uh, somewhere between two and maybe as high as 2.6, yep. meaning for every kilowatt in, I'm actually getting two point something uh, heat value out of that. And that's at producing in the range of 35,000 BTUs of that 100 degree water. Golly, we do lose amazing. a BTU value. The water temperature, we don't lose. We lose the amount of BTUs just for what we can get out of the air. Got it. Now at 100 degree water, and we get into a, a situation where we're 45, 47, 50 degrees, we're well over 60,000 BTUs all day long, every day, as long as there's power going to the unit. Wow. Right. That's one of the, the super impressive things. Now we're showing a, uh, a chart here that goes from one spectrum uh, to the other, one level to the other. Yep. When we were talking about efficiency before and our inverter, uh, compass uh, both inverter fans and inverter compressors on our units, the idea behind that is that unit's going to come on and this curve is gonna flatten out because if it knows it's targeting that 100 degree delivered water temperature, 120 to 10 degree delivered water temperature, it's gonna come up and it's gonna ramp the compressor and it's gonna turn the fans on to match the, where they need to go based on the outside ambient temperature to start targeting and getting to that 100 degree delivered temperature. So that means those compressors and those fans, they're gonna ramp up. They might go from 30 to 90 hertz, but maybe they're gonna hang out at 54 hertz and that fan might hang out at 500 RPMs and it's gonna stay there. So that, 
we're not a, at any point going to be, I'm only going to get X amount of COP. This is as efficient as it's going to get. I might get three and a half COP for the entire 25 minutes that the system runs. Mm. It doesn't just peak and then start to go down. Right. Right? This might so, be a good time to get some q and in, don't you think? Yeah, we do need to transition to Q&A, but before we do that, I want to give my own Q&A because I want to wrap this thought up, and this is probably a question for you, Terry. You mentioned the term boost heat, and I saw a couple questions. Uh, uh, I'm going to kind of summarize three or four questions, which are, what do we do for backup heat? Because what if it gets to minus 30 in my climate on the one day a year? What would you say to that, Terry? Well, we, we do design through our heat loss. We know what, what the, according to NOAA data, what the coldest climate is going to be in that area. And we typically uh, I'll put a little margin of error in for that. Uh, and and uh, uh, depending on which boost heat, you know, if you do the boost heaters in their uh, expand, in their uh, buffer tank, it has an upward limit on it. But there are times when we think that the particular climate is going to call for something more uh, robust in terms of boost heat. In which case, we might put an electro boiler in, which has even higher capacity than their boost heaters. Mm. And in some uh, jurisdictions, like for example in Vancouver, you're allowed to run a gas boiler so long as your primary source is a heat pump. And so there That's are occasions cool. when we will actually combine a gas boiler. I know you've done situations like mm. this where you have a gas boiler, and if you have a gas boiler in there, you have unlimited boost. Uh, not unlimited, but you have depending on the size, a lot more right? margin of boost. And, and that's where coming down, coming to the, uh, a company like Warmboard, dealing with the big picture, right? To, to not forget about some of those little things where uh, we might be and, able to And that's to our engineer's on. job. He's going to look and he says, oh, we're in Moose Jaw, right? Well, we can't get by with just the buffer tanker sure. boost. We're going to have to do something more, more robust yeah. Yeah. because it's our job to make sure that anybody that buys the Warmboard comfort system, with regardless of the heating method that, that we're heating the water with, that they don't have any days of the year that they are uncomfortable because that's our bragging right. <clears throat> yep, yep. Uh, Andre Lopez has a question, which I'm gonna summarize to, to actually go a little further <laughs> than his question, which is uh, for you, Terry, talk to us about cost, uh, including like, are these heat pumps generally more expensive than boilers? Or are they a one-to-one? -one? The answer is yes. They're <laughs> okay. more expensive. There's no question about give it. As you some, can see, give us some understanding. When you cost. look at a, that, that simple boiler on the wall and you look at a heat pump, it involves an outdoor unit, an indoor unit, a buffer tank, uh, a few more pumps, uh, a lot more head scratching by your engineers, this and that. And the heat pumps themselves are not inexpensive. They are more expensive just to buy the raw heat pump yep. by about two or three times what a boiler is. So we have a surcharge on any comfort system. We have a, a base price per square foot. Doesn't matter the size of the house, the number of zones you pick. Can we you decide. give us some of those numbers? Would that be all right? I wouldn't mind. It's about $6 a square foot uh, additional surcharge to do a heat pump over a, a, a natural gas boiler. Okay. There you go. And that's including everything that you need, the space Correct. vacuum unit Correct. itself. Yeah. It's a flat, all the, flat surcharge. All the systems, that's, the only thing that's not going to include is the labor, right? And I'm told by, the, by the, the rep that actually calls us, he says, compared to normal heat pumps, he says, because everybody else, not only do they have a, buy that extra cost heat pump, they spend a lot more time scratching their head and figuring it out and then buying and maybe trial and error, figuring out how to operate the whole thing. And so the labor costs go up. And so uh, he told me that $6 a square foot surcharge is actually incredibly competitive competitive in the marketplace yeah. today. Good. One of the things that I've, I've always come to know from my 20 plus years in the business or dealing with contractors, uh, there's nothing more expensive on any job than labor. So what that comfort system does is takes a lot of that labor, that's scratching you, your I head will, labor. I will correct you. There's one thing more expensive than labor, callbacks. Well, <laughs> because enough. you don't get to charge the client for it. Yeah, you that's know? right. That's real expensive. So the, the more complete and uh, included the system is through the warm board system and the space pack unit outside, the less head scratching labor, that extra uh, inherent cost you think might come across, come along with one of these a little bit more advanced systems. And we yeah. want to eliminate callbacks. That's great. This is a little bit of an ancillary question, but I like this. This is from Ralph Teeman and Ralph says, uh, is there a warm board solution for ground floor applications? Meaning like if I have a basement that I want radiant in as well, what do you suggest? Do it, do it all the time. And, and what would that look like? Well, first off, I want to be very, very careful on this. Uh, uh, we do do hybrid systems where there's tubes in the slab in the basement. The, the, the fast response of warm board is less important in a basement because uh, it has less passive solar gains. Right. You have all the soil around the basement walls. And so there's a lot less temperature variation. So I'd say uh, uh, most of our, of our basement installations, we combine uh, tubing and slab with warm board on the, the uh, frame first and second floors. And, and we will engineer that for you too, and we'll calculate all that for you, and we'll sell you the equipment for that. 
But a lot of people actually, if they know they have a bone dry basement because warm board's not pressure treated, so we don't want to have it ever be in a flooded basement. But if you happen to have a daylight basement or a basement that's just in an area where, my, I have a basement in my house, there's never been a drop of water in it. it just happens to be the ground table, the water table is, is beneficial to me. It's fine to put warm board on top of a slab. We do yeah. that all the time. We have a standard details for attaching warm board. And a lot of times people will do this precisely because they want hardwood down there and they need oh, something yeah. to nail the hardwood to. Mm -hmm. And so we see a lot of slab overlay. There's a non-trivial amount of slab overlay of, of warm board. Love it. Uh, another question um, from Tarin. What is the typical break even in years for a heat pump system? That's a hard question. But I bet it's you have all a good over the, it, it there. depends so much on, on uh, how you use the house, uh, what the heat loss is of the house, uh, a bunch of other variables. I always tell people I don't, I don't try and sell warm based on uh, on a cost because yeah. it is a more expensive system. Yeah. But it is nice to know that most of the people we see using it see um, uh, a break even in about uh, ten to twenty years. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. And, and if you think about it too, the other I guess variable we could say that sometimes is higher or lower is your per kilowatt hour, right? Your right. charge per That's kilowatt right, hour, depending on where you're. And at. where we are at geographically, like even in the in the state of New York where I'm from, I'm sixteen cents a kilowatt. Um, I could go four hours uh, west to Buffalo, and we have customers with air to water heat pumps that are five cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah. Right? You get five cents a kilowatt, you, it's incredibly efficient. You can't yeah. find anything that is as efficient as that based right. on your. But your the payback will, will be, will be uh, longer. But if you got a high electrical cost, the payback is faster. Yeah. Right. That's right. right. Because your delta there is a little bit different. Yeah. That's right. Uh, George Hall has a question for you, Terry. Can warm board be used to heat an entire home, or is this for just a few individual rooms? What yeah, I'm asking a, is whether you'd need an additional home heating system, or is this used as the primary system? One of the most common room? questions that comes up, we are the 100% of your heat in virtually every condition that I can think of. We have two projects that are operating in Antarctica. If you want to know cold climates we can handle, try McMurdo Sound. Oh my gosh! We, that we, and that, cool. the first project was a was a mess hall down there because uh, the, it was all government work down there, and they liked it so much we then uh, shipped a more, bunch more down. Uh, we ship it on a C one thirty. That's mm -hmm. how it gets down there. Yep. And we did a weather balloon hanger with it as well. So uh, wow. yeah, it is one hundred percent of your heat. You need no other heat. That's awesome. Uh, Richard has a question for you, Terry. Can you give us some understanding of what war the warm board system costs overall? Is there any guidance? I know this is a nationwide or even all of North America, it, but do you, it, do you it's have approximately, any guidelines? I know we were talking about deltas, right? Six dollars more for for a, the, for a heat pump than a standard gas boiler. If I just want to throw a dart at the wall, I'd say about ten bucks a foot more than a forced air system. Okay, there you go. And by the way, but by, by the time you dump it into your uh, uh, your mortgage and you, you pay the, the cost on it, it's like, I hate to use this as such a classic salesman thing, it's like a Starbucks a day, you know, right. but it's, it's that kind of a thing. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, five or 10 bucks a day, you know, to, to enjoy um, not having to wear slippers, yeah. never having to notice you have a heating system. To sit down there, I, I was sitting in my my, uh, my TV room the other night, my wife had gone to bed, I'm watching a Niners game on the TV, it's like 37 degrees out and raining and it's kind of nasty. And I'm just in heaven. I just feel this robust sense of comfort and warmth and everything is right in the world. Mm -hmm. Not a sound, no blower coming on, you know, nothing to interrupt me at all. And all of a sudden I just feel this enveloped in this tremendous comfort. And until you've experienced it, by the way, people who have experienced radiant can never go back. Yeah, Once you, you can never go. It's like when you live next to that train and, and then that comes by and people say, how can you stand? They say, what? You know, because you get used to it. But then once you move away from the train tracks and you're out in the country, you think, this is the way life should be. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, as a side note to that, I just turned 50 recently. Uh, so you've got 10 years on me, Terry. But uh, I've noticed as I've gotten older, I'm more- 25, si actually. Come on now, that's not true. <laughs> yeah. You're 60, right? Uh, I've noticed that I'm more sensitive to weird, uh, like elevator, what I would consider elevator music or like white noise. They bought, like I'm hearing the fan in my office mm -hmm. now running here in the seminar, and it, it, it hasn't bothered me, but I've noticed it a bunch. And I think that's something about your system that I've not personally experienced that I think is really interesting to think about. You know, being in a house where it's really comfortable and you're not hearing anything. Uh, you know, I'm in my second home, I'm in my mountain house, I'm in my primary residence, and I've built a really good envelope, which means generally my envelope's gonna be pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. And now I've got a system that's heating my house without any noise or any airflow whatsoever. I think that part of it, that comfort, 
uh, is that intangible that's really hard to go. It's X dollars per month or your payback is X dollars. The people that are gonna be interested in your system, they probably can afford it. This is not a, this is not a first time resident. This is not starter home. You know, this is definitely more of the custom home, maybe even the luxury custom home type system. But if you're if you're building a good house and a and a, a house that you want to tow that you are kind of telling people this is my forever home, mm-hmm. uh, or I heard Terry uh, jokingly call it his toe ta- toe tag homes is a word that I've yeah. used. I'd had not heard that before. Like I want to be dragged out of this house with a toe tag on. This is the kind of system that you should be thinking about. And I was comfortable till the day I died. Yeah, I mean this is this comfort is this intangible that I've realized in my new build that I definitely didn't have in my 70s remodel. Mm -hmm. uh, That's really hard to sell and is really intangible. And for me, it's not even the the comfort, uh, the energy bills, it's not even about necessarily how much is my electric bill. You know, funny enough, my new house that I built is about three or 400 square feet more than my old house. My energy bills are about the same, maybe even slightly more, because I've got these things like radiant tile heaters, which are resistant style heaters, and I. Uh, I've got a, a a big luxury that I've absolutely loved, which is my towel warmer mm-hmm. uh, that I've got hot and dry towels with. And so my electric bill is actually a little higher. I'm about to add solar to my house, which I'm hoping to get to get it to zero. It's not that I can't afford the electric bills. It's not that I'm trying to necessarily save the earth. Like I want to do the right thing, right? But it's really about comfort for me. And I think a lot of my clients are very like-minded. Like they want to do the right thing and they want to maybe move towards heat pump technology because they're interested in their carbon footprint. They're interested in doing the right thing. But if I can couple that with a really comfortable house that I absolutely love living in, then it's not so much about the cost as it is my experience and in fine, the house. Fine custom homes start at about our neck of the woods, about three, $400 a square foot. They go up to 1,000, 2,000 a foot. For sure. So $10 a foot in that, scheme is not that much money no. if, if it is the primary comfort of your house. And it's the reason why we build houses, by the way. That's right. It's, we build houses because the temperature outside is not what we want. And, and it is, it is- uh, I don't want to live in a tent. Right on. <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, Phillips, the, uh, the famous architect, he says, at the end of the day, architecture is shelter. Yeah, that's that's right. what it is. It's shelter. And if it can be comfortable shelter, it's good architecture. For sure. And I, oh, but one last little thing. We live in a, we moved to a fabulous facility, one of the nicest buildings built in, in Santa Cruz County by a famous architect. We got it for cheap because it was kind of empty and we could get a good price on it. But it's a, I'm an architect and I, I, I love the building. It has the crummiest heating system impossible. <laughs> and when that fan comes on and I have to raise my voice in a meeting, it uh... irritates the hell of me. I said, God, Kevin Roche was the name of the architect. I said, you built this beautiful building and you put this crappy heating system in. Why would you do that? Uh, That's so funny, for sure. Guys, hopefully you learned something today. I know there was a bunch of unanswered questions, um, but I want to point out in particular that that Warmboard has a team of folks. Some of them were behind the scenes today uh, answering questions. They would love to help you. Uh, they'd love to give you some ballpark pricing. They'd love to talk to you about your specific projects and your specific climates. Uh, and remember, they're partnering with Space Pack, so everything's coming from Warmboard. Uh, and we had Jim on as the nerdy uh, engineer who could really break it down to us as builders and architects uh, and as folks interested in building a custom home. But everything's coming through the Warmboard team. So this all starts with a phone call or an email to them. I'm sure wherever you're watching or listening to this, there'll be a link to them. But uh, tell us your website address, Terry. Is it's it- really hard to figure out. Warmboard.com. That's a pretty simple website, warmboard.com. There's the uh, logo, add a.com when you're good to go. One nice thing about it, so you call us, a human being picks up and they're knowledgeable. Wow, an actual person. We we have no voice uh, tree, no phone tree, none of that stuff. We actually have real human beings trained in Warmboard who answer the phone. That's pretty cool. And again, I would just say that one of the things that I've really enjoyed about Warmboard, besides uh, great people, is that they've got a system that me as a builder uh, makes it really easy on me because I'm not buying this parts kit from all these different resources and putting it together like the uh, nuclear submarine boiler room. Everything comes from them. They've engineered it all. They pre-tested it. It's all ready to go so that my plumber, who's a smart company, but maybe doesn't do radiant every day, can take their system and install it. And I know I'm going to have a great install with a really happy client. And I think that's ultimately 
Uh, what we're looking for as builders out there is happy clients who come back year after year and say, Matt, I've been in this house five years, 10 years, 15 years. I love this house. I don't want to move anytime soon. That's my goal as a builder. So big thanks to Warmboard for sponsoring today's webinar. And thank you, Jim and the Space Back folks for thank coming, uh, bringing your uh, your giant uh, display today on the overhead bin and the airplane. Yeah. I know that was a hassle getting that yeah, here. Yeah, we so. got it through. TSA was appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> TSA Pre did not appreciate that coming through. But uh, guys, big thanks to Warmboard for sponsoring today. Like I said, link to them below or warmboard.com. If you're not currently a subscriber and you're watching this, uh, on a pre-recorded version, sign up for our newsletter because that's how you find out about future webinars. We're sending that to all our newsletter folks uh, and we send that newsletter out twice a week with everything that's new on our website, buildshownetwork.com. If you don't realize, we're up to like 14 new videos every single week. So we've got a giant amount of content uh, over there on our website with 12 different contributors besides myself. It's been really, really fun. Uh, getting nerdy in the details today. But if you want to come live to one of these events in the future, sign up for that newsletter so you can uh, sign it. With that being said, guys, follow us on Instagram or TikTok. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.